Greetings to friends from Africa, Europe, Asia, and the Americas. I am Harold D. Weaver, Jr., your host, temporarily based in Oaxaca, Mexico. Our Black Quaker Project Ministry of Wellesley Friends Meeting, New England Yearly Meeting of Friends, Quakers, welcomes you back for the second event of the 2023 Black Quaker Lives Matter Film Festival and Forum, co-sponsored by the American Friends Service Committee. Today, we will screen the groundbreaking 2012 documentary, The Prep School Negro. Discuss the challenges and contributions of African-Americans in Quaker schools, and honor renowned Quaker educator, Joan Countryman. Why did President Barack Obama and President Bill Kennedy send their children, Bill Clinton, excuse me, send their children to a Quaker school in DC? Why did Dr. Ralph Bunch Sr. Dr. Ernest B. Kalabala Sr. and Dr. Harold D. Weaver Sr. send their offspring to a Quaker school near Philadelphia in the late 1940s and early 1960s. What about the 70 years since? Is there something special about a Quaker education? That is a key question we are posing today. Is there something special about a Quaker education? If so, what is it? What does it especially mean to African Americans? Students, teachers, and administrators. We hope you will gain new insights and new knowledge from today's program. We hope you will find the film and the discussion both evocative and provocative as we tackle head on some of the issues facing people of color within the global community. We are fortunate to be joined by a panel of eminent guest experts that include both our honoree Joan and the director of today's film, Andre Robert Lee. Welcome, Joan. Joan Kennedy Countryman grew up in the Germantown section of Philadelphia and in 1958 became the first African-American graduate of Germantown Friends School. Her career in education included serving as a teacher and administrator in Friends and other independent schools, as the head of the Lincoln School in Providence, Rhode Island, and as the interim head of both the Oprah Winfrey Leadership Academy in South Africa and the Atlanta Girls School in Georgia. She has been a member of Germantown Friends Meeting since 1958. We are thrilled to have Joan today. Join us as honoree, as facilitator, and as guest expert. Thank you, Joan. Welcome, Andre. Andre Robert Lee is an award-winning filmmaker, keynote speaker, consultant, writer, and educator. Andre has served as a professor of writing at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania and taught filmmaking at Germantown Friends School. His most recent film, Virtually Free, is the story of incarcerated youth in Richmond, Virginia, and is still on the festival circuit. Thank you for joining us, Andre, and for presenting your film. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome, Emma. Emma Bracker teaches history at Moses Brown School in Providence, Rhode Island, and has extensive experience in Quaker education as both student and teacher. Graduate of Haverford College, BA in History and the University of Pennsylvania, Masters of Education. 
She spent seven years teaching, coaching, and working in residential life at West Town School in Westchester, Pennsylvania. Thank you for joining us, Emma. I now invite Andre to introduce his film, The Prep School Negro, after which there will be an interaction among Andre, Joan, and Emma before we open the discussion to the general public. Thank you so much, Dr. Weaver, for the introduction and good morning to everyone. Good afternoon to everyone, or morning, depending on where you are. Um, it's been fun to watch the chat and see all the places that I've been to visit and all the various meeting houses I've been lucky enough to pop into and say hello. Uh, as I've toured with the movie for a long time now, um, <clears throat> I'll just say briefly this and then and let us begin our conversation. I was sharing this with the um, other members of the panel this morning before we started. I just came back from Colorado yesterday. I was at the Dawson School showing the film, The Prep School Negro to faculty and staff as part of a professional development day. And the theme of the day was, um, you know, do we, do we research development or do we develop together? Or are we bringing our own ideas within the room? How can teachers and their interactions become the development that is? Which I thought was so powerful. And I love that they use the film as a tool to have that conversation. And then finally, I'll say this, uh, one of the teachers said, you know, you, you allow for a lot of silence in the movie and they made it work better. And I was like, well, you know what? That's, that's how I was raised and that's my education. Um, so I'll close out my little section and say, say thank you so much for everyone having me here today and for joining. I look forward to the conversation. The first question I said I'd like to ask you, and I still do, which is um, has has to do with your um, having done the film some time ago. Uh, and well, first of all, you came to GFS in the in the uh, '80s and uh, graduated in 1989. Uh, <clears throat> sometime after that, you made this extraordinary film. Uh, and you presented it uh, in many places uh, since then. And I, I just, I'm curious about what things occur to you that have changed uh, now from, from when you first made the film. Um, you know, it, in terms of things that have changed, you know, it's, it's interesting, I remember in our prep, some of the language was Joan will lead the conversation depending on how the spirit leads her. Um, and I was thinking about my intro and I had a couple things I wanted to say, but after listening to Bayard Rustin sing and seeing all the people from all over the world chiming in and looking at your face and Emma's face and just thinking about the power of this experience of that we're all here, I, I decided to just cut it short and let folks watch the film and have the experience. Um, you know, the things I've seen change, um, I was thinking about, this, thinking about this as I was watching, uh, students are much more vocal right now than I think they were than compared to when I was in school. Um, last night, one of my, I have this thing with one of the families that I work with at Germantown Friends School. One of the students, he has a, a, family, very, a family very parallel to mine growing up. A lower income kid on scholarship at the school, great kid. And I went away for the week to, to Denver and the family doesn't have a family car. And so what I do is I say, hey, if you take him to the airport and pick me up, I'll give you my car my whole trip. And he's 18, a senior at GFS. And he's like, sure, you know, and we talked about it. And we talk about a lot of things in the school and he's part of what's called BASE at the school, which is a group for the student, student group for boys of color. And there's a pretty nice little handful of them. They all get together. And I've been going to their meetings and watching them talk and the camaraderie that they have in the meetings. Another, there's, an, there's another group called Sisters. The camaraderie and the friendship they all have in their groups, of just sometimes just being together. I'll go in there and they'll just be in there quietly eating their lunch or they'll be singing gospel songs or they'll be laughing, goofing around. 
I think I think one of the biggest things I see um, is the agency that students feel. It's it's not where I think it needs to be at all, but it has changed a great deal, and that gives me hope that students are standing up and saying, "This is what I need and what I want." And I think the schools are hearing that and struggling with how to um, deal with that. I'll also say that I think the family um, presence at the school, from my perspective, has changed also. Whereas some families, oh. uh, their families are much more active and involved. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and to take your line, mm -hmm. we're making efforts to make them not feel like a guest in a stranger's house. You know, I think folks are moving more into a space of thinking this is my house and I belong here and struggling with with what that looks like and sounds like. I'll even our chat is a really great example. There's been a really quickly debate going on about people basically, in my opinion, having a black experience watching a movie, making comments and reacting to moments and some folks saying Shh, that's too distracting. And it's like, well, actually, how do we arrive at this space? and allow people to have the experience they have and find ways to make sure we have our own experience and, you know, turn off the chat if it's too distracting for you. There are, as opposed to saying, this is the way we must do it. What's the way to move towards welcoming in different experiences? I think the Quakers call it constant revelation, if I'm correct. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, I wanted to say two things. One, we agreed to, to have this these questions addressed by all anybody who wanted to in the of the panelists. And I'm going to ask Emma Emma in a minute to uh, to to uh, tell us something about what's in her, her head. I also want to say that um, I heard this time watching the film something which you um, I j didn't remember, which is a comment you made about being the only black person in the room. And I would say that my experience having started at Germantown Friends in 1948, uh, much of my experience was that once I was there and for the rest of my life until very recently, and still I am conscious of whether or not there's any black person in the room uh, and I, it's, uh, I, I, I mainly want to say thank you for reminding me to, to, to ponder that a bit. But em, Emma, I, I, I also feel the need to say to our wonderful audience that Emma and I have a unique relationship. <laughs> uh, in addition to being part of the family, of my family of, uh, of, of, of ed educators, she is my granddaughter. So. Uh, I hope that doesn't uh, interfere, Emma, in any, I know it won't <laughs> with anything you say. My whole life in independent schools, I've been Joan Countryman's granddaughter. So <laughs> I'm, ha I'm happy to claim that one. <laughs> I, um, I was thinking about, Andre, what you were saying about student agency and students asking for what they need um, and thinking about a number of experiences that I had students, they want things now. They want, they want, or not even now, they want things to have happened yesterday. And, and talking, I um, teach, I taught a peace and justice class at Westtown for a number of years and spent a lot of time talking about um, social justice movements and, and about the amount of time that it took to accomplish things and talking to students about like, yes, we are moving in the right direction. I think that Quaker schools, I heard, I once heard Quaker schools um, compared to aircraft carriers that were moving in the right direction. It's just slow. And, <laughs> and the kids, they want it faster. They want it faster. They want it faster. And I often feel like I want it faster. I want it faster. I want it faster. Um, but, but talking to kids about what progress looks like, how to make progress how, what incremental looks like and when are we okay with how slow it is and when do we need to, to give ourselves a little, a little nudge to, to move even faster. There we are. <laughs> there we are uh, and, and challenging uh, our communities to, to, uh, to move in directions that sometimes seem frightening, uh, but they're, they're there. 
Andre, you're shaking your head. Yes, is that? Uh, <laughs> just... I'm just agreeing so much that that I never heard the line about the the, the airline. Um, <laughs> the plane. What's what I said? Almost taking bunker, but what's the the airline hatch? Uh, that makes because they're so big, <laughs> and to move it. Yeah, the thought of moving it is a is a is a big um, and I I think that you know I um. I, I'm just nodding and, and agreeing with all the stuff that's being said and appreciating it because it's, you know, I'm sitting here in this in this space in my house in Philadelphia and, and I was watching that last thing with my mother where she gets a stick and I have the stick mounted on the wall over over my right shoulder and it's just a reminder of all the ways that um, space and time and events stay with you and, you know, I, I saw a comment in the section about how have things this sounds like these schools sound like the same schools of the 80s, you know, and as we're saying, there is some change and that change is slow and how slow is too slow? Um, how do we within a quickly process embrace and acknowledge that we want to reach some consensus and then when we come in and we try and bulldoze and push through, is that, are those real solutions? Um, it's a, there aren't perfect solutions, I don't think. And we're trying to deconstruct something that is around 400 plus years old here in our country. We haven't had true reconciliation, I think. Uh, I th think about the, speak, the point you made in your um, your uh, little video, Joan, about what happened in South Africa versus what happens in America in terms of acknowledging our history and our past. And I, I'm hoping that this movie and this kind of conversation is... Um, a way forward. And if I may I have permission to respond to one of the questions that's um, put. Sure, sure. Yeah, I, I just feel the need to say it. And this is why the film is made. Uh, there's a, looks like a student who's saying, her name is Rhea Jones, who's saying she's an African-American student at a friend's school. And people at school ask her if she's Black because she's light-skinned. And how do I politely tell them to accept me for who I am and tell them to move beyond skin color? Um, Thank you for that question, Rhea. Uh, you're not alone in that question. Many, many people can speak to that. Also, I love to hear Joan and Emma's response, but I'll, I'll first just say, um, this film was made for you so you can have this kind of platform and space to say that and to be heard. Um, and oftentimes I find when people are projecting that kind of information onto you, that's something inside of them they're dealing with and it has nothing to do with you. And I know that may hurt. Um, I think I think a way to respond to them is you, you kind of said it well there. Like, you know, whenever someone says, well, Andre, what are you? I say, oh, well, I'm Andre, let's start there. <laughs> and get to know me, then build out all the other adjectives um, and nouns that define who I am. So my, my little thought is to keep strong in the face of that and to, you know, have faith and confidence in yourself and not let that tear you down. But I'll ask Emma and Joan to maybe share. I will just jump in a bit, and I want Emma to share as well, but my grandmother used to say, uh, you never know what color is going to come out. And I have two children and four grandchildren, and I would say we're all uh, beautiful colors. <laughs> and um, uh, I... <laughs> The other thing I thought in my that comes to mind is a, um, a comment, a, actually a paper that a student, one of my um, students wrote. She may have written this in a journal because I had people re keep journals in math class. But she told of a uh, she was doing some work in in a school, in an elementary school somewhere, and and one of the children said, "What color are you?" to her. And she then goes on to explore what a powerful que question, challenge that was for her to respond. So, but Emma, it's your turn. You know, I have, I have a few things bumping around in my head. One is that, you know, as I am, I identify as biracial um, and I often enter spaces and conversations around diversity work and DEI and, and, and this conversation, in fact, and think, okay, how am I going to fit that into conversation? So people know that it's, I'm legitimate here, like that I have like my credibility here. Um, and sometimes I think that that's necessary. And sometimes I think that's my own stuff. Um, 
So I, when people ask me about my racial identity, I feel like they recognize something in me. And, and so I take that in my own life as sort of a recognition of I'm not just white. Um, and I think about another story, another family story of my grandmother talking about um, a comment that was made to her when she was a kid on her way back from camp of something about her hair and that she told her mother this and her mother said, our job is to teach them. Um, and so as a, as an educator from a family of educators, my response as frustrating and exhausting as it becomes when people mess up over and over and over again, um, my response is, I, I, it's my job to teach them. It's my job to teach them. Um, and maybe they'll get it right. And the more that I can, the more that I can be graceful and, and teach and then go back to my people who understand me um, and, and fill my cup there, the better, um, the better off we are. I like and that. I recognize that my privilege as someone who looks white is that I, my privilege and my responsibility is to take on that work because it, 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 um, I am not subject to, to microaggressions in some of the same ways. And so my responsibility is, is to take on that work so that, um, so that others don't have to. I, I, that leads me to, um, to the question that I was supposed to address, uh, which is French schools are, are often seen as institutions that encourage in students a restless uneasiness about the status quo. I, I wonder if, if, he, if uh, first of all, I would say, um, uh, uh, that says to me, that speaks to me about, about my own experience as a student. Um, certainly I would account for my, my activism as um, a directly coming from my experience at Germantown Friends from the beginning, um, that uh, speaking out and speaking up was what I was supposed to do. Um, but but uh, beyond that, when I look back on my uh, now uh, more than 80 years of, <laughs> of participation in this in this uh, in this time, I I um, I'm just grateful for the fact that I think the school <laughs> taught me how how to do it in that sense. Yeah, I, I, I um, it's interesting because I'm now teaching at Germantown Friends School some filmmaking classes. Um, and, you know, it's kind of funny. And I, I have to express some gratitude to you, Joan, for being my calculus teacher, that um, sometimes that spirit to push back shows up in all kinds of ways <laughs> bring to the table. So I apologize if I was pushing back too hard back in the day. Um, I, I think that <laughs> I, I, now I, I find ways to really embrace it and have patience with how a class is going to go when I'm teaching, because sometimes ch children just shift the topic. You have to be ready, ready to go with it. And a lot of people I, I'm finding aren't. I, I was just having to talk with a friend yesterday who's another filmmaker, and she was talking about our work together. And she was saying she's not very comfortable with believing the process. She has to, have, has to know what's going to happen in the next step. And I think my Quaker education is a part of that, of, of, of thinking, okay, this is going to work itself out and I'm going to try and disrupt it and believe that it's going to work, to go forward, <laughs> you know, and luckily in most cases it does. So I, I, I have to say that I think that that shows up um, in my work a great deal. And I'm also seeing it with some of the students I've had for the past couple of years who are in college now, who are sending me messages about how they're protesting and turning things around and demanding change and pushing for administrative um, restructuring, you know, which is what they should be doing, which is, which is great. So I think, you know, for me, it, my own personal life has been structured and a foundation is laid to 
have that kind of pushback against the status quo. And I see it with my students also and trying to encourage it in them. And it's it's to go back to our initial point, I think the agency we see within students um, is a reflection of that. Uh, and they're maybe taking it a little more seriously or, or, or not more seriously. They're being a little more aggressive about it in a Quakerly way, but more aggressively about um, what their needs are. It's interesting that you say the, the being more aggressive about it. Um, I think that in in my eight years teaching in Quaker institutions, I've seen initial discomfort and still some discomfort um, with the way students go about change. Um, and I've seen some, I don't know what the right word is. I've seen um, an expanding understanding of what the right way to or, or maybe not even understanding of what the right way is to go about enacting change, the Quakerly way, but a sort of letting go of of the right way, or letting go of the it, that's that's not Quakerly, or to that saying that there's been a, a a broadening understanding of what can fit into and what we can do, how we can achieve our goals, how students can achieve their goals in a productive way and in a way that honors the values that we hold dear, even if it doesn't look or sound exactly the same way that that people are used to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, um, <laughs> I was going to, first of all, I, I, without since we all, Andre and I have have um, particular relationship with with one friend's school, and that school. Um, and I'm not trying to to promote that view, their view at all. But what I one of the things I got from from Germantown friends is the uh, is the biblical statement: "Behold, I have set before you an open door." Um, and the idea that that's my part of my job is to open the door because it was open for me, <laughs> and and um, so for and that seems to me to be what Quaker education has been about is is that sense that that we can do that that it is the job of all of us to to consider and to make changes. Um, What there's a question about um, engaging within Quaker schools a, a push for a broader understanding of truth that is racially inclusive. I mean, I, I, it seems to me that that is yes a, an important challenge, but furthermore, um, uh, <laughs> ask learning how to ask good questions is is the only way we're going to do that. And we will continue to change um, to be. And I, so for me, being open to the fact that whatever we think resolves something may, in fact, as Andre, you were suggesting, may still need to be um, questioned and and, uh, and and addressed in a new way that then or something. It'll never, we'll never get it all right, I'm afraid, is what I may be saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think, you know, that what your point, and it ties to, I think it ties in nicely with another comment that came in the Q&A in terms of, you know, folks not hearing about Quaker spiritual understandings relating to the issues raised in the film. And I think you just tapped into them. Um, from my my interpretations, you know, I grew up in a Southern Baptist home, went to a Catholic elementary school, came to Germantown Friends School. And when I was there, it probably had a good 60 50 to 60 percent Jewish population. So I was surrounded by all these different religions. And the one, and you said this, and it tapped into me that it happened to you at 15, it happened to me. Maybe that's why we have so much kindredness between us. When I heard the Quaker principles, you know, of there is being good inside of everyone and look for the light, um, look for the God that's in everyone and provide an experience for them to be there. I was in, 
You know, I was like, if this is the dogma of this church, I want to, I want it. And so I think that what I see and what I try and put into place, and I think I try to do this in the film also, was um, allowing for each individual to have their true, honest experience. And then for us to interact with them and value them. Um, And I, you know, the film, the film is a, is a sad tale of a boy who was ashamed of where he came from, who didn't couldn't see and feel the love that was surrounding him everywhere and I was fortunate enough with the film to go and have my eyes open up and go wow you had you had so many people you didn't even know about holding you up and pushing you up um and for me I think I've been on the journey of of you know to tie it with 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 anti-racism when I look at our country we have principles and laws and institutions that define who we're supposed to be, but we haven't truly gotten there. You know, every, every, as it was written, man, every person is not equal. Everyone does not have access to um, the pursuit of life, life, liberty, and happiness. And when I think about that with the Quaker principles and in the, in the institutions, I think that Quakerism is all about everyone should, deserves a great equal opportunity for education and a chance to exist and thrive in society. And what are the ways that we as humans get in the way of those principles and ideas that we have laid out in front of us? We we stop it. We get uncomfortable. We get weirded out. We don't we don't speak when something happens that makes us feel strange. We say they're wrong and bad, as opposed to saying, "Well, that's different from me. How can I go forward and embrace it and learn and mm-hmm. value and be in, and live in the space of constant revelation?" Um, and and and. I'll, I'll call it Quakerly chaos of like, we're all just so different, <laughs> but let's get in this space and be quiet for a little while and, and let it happen, you know? I, um, since Emma is a history teacher, I don't mind saying that I, I am I just reading now reading 1619 and I feel challenged to rethink everything I ever learned <laughs> about the history of, um, and I'm not even just talking about the country, I'm, I'm our country. I, uh, I, um, I, am, I wonder how, how it feels as, for you as a teacher um, to have to be operating at a time when, when people are saying that, you know, <laughs> that it's, uh, bad to talk about the United States in the way that 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 study uh, is has made us uh, talk. You know, I, uh, the the glib answer is that I'm glad I teach in Rhode Island and not in some of the other states. And I'm glad that I teach in a Quaker school as opposed to um, in schools where my, where my curriculum is much more directed. I think that the other blessing of teaching in a Quaker school is that we have these sets of historically grounded, faith grounded, you know, values and, and tenants and, and testimonies that, that I can point to and say, if, if I get pushback or if I'm questioned on my content or my curriculum or the way that I'm teaching, I know, and I can point to to those values and say that no, we're not, we're not engaging in in this discourse like this, or we are going to talk about marginalized voices. We are going to look at the other ways and the other people who who lived on this continent um, because because we believe this, um, and it and then it it's removed from all the noise outside and and it's not about me making a political statement by choosing my curriculum it's about me grounding in the values of the school and and having that to to fall back on and to and to work off of um makes makes my history classes feel like like we can do that work without having to have to have a fight about it You want to take a history course with her, <laughs> Andre? You read my mind. That's exactly what I was thinking. That's exactly what I was, I was like. Do I say it? 
<laughs> you can say it. I say it all the time. <laughs> I learned from you, so. Oh. So fantastic. That's great. That's great. Yeah, I, I you know, I, I've explored that 1619 project and um, there's so many relevant points in it. I, I, I and I, I think about what's happening in our country with uh, the pushback um, and the, the presentation of, of critical race theory as, as a real thing. Um, and I've been talking to students about what that means. Why do we think this is happening? And it's, it's consistent with American history. The effort to take down and disenfranchise and, and, and take away power from people who are um, rising up and giving an equal opportunity to participate in, in our American society. Um, one thing I, I'd love to put up a 1619 project that I'll, I hope to encourage other folks to pursue it is the modern day evaluation at a company stems from the plantation. You know, when you are evaluated at a company, it stems from, from one of the first times in the country a corporation had to sit down and look at each of the its enslaved people and make a note for how much cotton they bailed um, on a weekly, monthly basis or daily basis. Like uh, that, that to me is like shocking every time I hear that. Um, and that's that's a nugget of what's in that 1619 project. It is so fantastic. Um, Nicole did a fantastic job and all the other writers and everyone involved in it. Well, we could go on talking about uh, <laughs> a long list of things. I, um, I actually, there are a lot of questions and comments. I, I think maybe it's time to go to the Q and A uh, part so we can uh, hear from our vast audience, which uh, I'm impressed as, as these questions fly by uh, how many, people are engaged and and I before I stop being a particular um, clerk of the meeting I um, I just want to say again Andre um, how how blessed I feel that you made that film and and um, and and we're and are open to um, thinking about it uh, continually and in can continuously uh, bringing to, to uh, the rest of us an, a chance to reflect on who we are and who's, who's around us. So thank you. And um, Emma and I, we're all here, still here for a few minutes more, but let's, let's, let's look at the, some of the questions from the, the audience. Thank you all for that wonderful dialogue. We'll be making a recording of the forum portion of our event available to our audience and followers at a later date. Um, I will facilitate the Q&A between our uh, wonderful guest expert panel. Um, for As a reminder for the Q&A, if there is a question that you have not already submitted, uh, please type it into the uh, box that bo comes up when you hit the Q&A button at the bottom right-hand corner of your Zoom window. And uh, we apologize for uh, the inevitable questions that we may not be able to get to. Um, okay, so the first question I will read uh, is from Pamela Williams. Uh, she asks, now that there are more programs such as Breakthrough, Prep for Prep, and social media aspects from student diversity conferences that increase interactions for students across geographies, what seems to have changed and what has remained the same? Emma, you want to go first? <laughs> um, yes, I would say that um, the I think the the primary thing is that that there there are more students from both diverse racial backgrounds and diverse socioeconomic backgrounds um, in schools that there there is a higher higher level of diversity um, in schools. And so it's, we're seeing less of, um, I was about the, the beginning of the film when kids are talking about like there, you may be the first black person that a student has interacted with socially. Um, and I think that that is, is much different. Um, I would say that in terms of what's remained the same, I think that there is still the code switching and the 
it's being fluent in two different dialects. I think that students are still feeling very much like, um, I remember having a conversation with a student at Westtown who talked about her, the train ride from New York to, to Philadelphia or actually to Paoli. Um, but that train ride was when she switched. She made the shift from home to school and then the other way around. And so I think that that is very much still, still something. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think I'm finding um, that I amplify all that you said. Like, I, I agree with that. This question is always tricky to answer because every single institution is different, you know, and every single family and students different. There are some general statements, but, um, you know, um, there are, and there are some similarities. Um, so I, I think a change I am seeing um, is that I want to see more of it. I'm seeing parents, and I think what you your mention of different social economic backgrounds, seeing parents being much more demanding now of the institutions in ways that are surprising for some schools, you know, and have to be acknowledged and, and dealt with. There's, I felt like when I was there, there was lots of whispers in the parking lot about the problems, but now I see people marching into the head of school's office like, hi, can I talk to you about my child's experience, you know, which is important. And it's like, well, you you wanted them in here and it's not, they're not just a guest to go into that, that quotation again. They need to feel like a fully welcomed, included, valued, loved, supported, and appreciated member of the community. And um, the struggle is on for how to make that happen. Uh, the programs do still exist, but I, I'm just, and I push for it also. I've been working with a family that's trying to get one a, a sibling of a student into that school that Joan referenced that we both know so well. And, you know, they were they were cautious and like, well, can we, can, I was like, yes, you can and you should. Go speak about what you want. Go speak about what you need. And when you're in there, ask the school what, they're, what they will provide for your child. It's not all about um, you all coming here and, and having to be something for the institution. Well, how are they gonna take care of your baby I'm at the school? Thank you. If um, none of you have another word on that question, I'll move to a, a follow-up. Okay. Um, this is from also, um, if for those of you that still may be submitting questions, if there is a question you'd like to direct to a specific panelist, please feel free to indicate it to us. Um, now, our next question comes from Carmen Rayner. When considering the intersection between the Quaker belief that truth is Oh, my apologies. This question was already addressed in our in our discussion. So um, I'll move to another. Um, Joan, I believe this is for you. You attended two private schools, one Catholic and one Quaker. How similar, different were your experiences across two private schools? So that's for Andre, in fact. Oh. <laughs> but let me just first say that that one of the things I've noticed just in preparing for, for this day was that I started school in public school in Germantown and it was an integrated school. So my, my uh, uh, this was right after World War II and uh, I can, I, I, I went back and looked at pictures that were taken in the classroom just to prove, prove to myself that my, what I thought was true was true. And that, that was that in, in, in kindergarten, first, second, third grade, until third grade, um, I, uh, I was in an integrate, in a, a racially diverse and actually economically diverse group. Um, so that probably eased my, my um, journey into Germantown Friends in a lot of ways. Hmm. Now, Andre, you the question really is for you. Right? <laughs> well, you did a, you did a great setup because um, my my school was not integrated at all. You know, my school was in a neighborhood called West Oak Lane, which I think was a neighborhood initially of um, middle to lower income Irish and ca- Irish and uh, Italian families that migrated when black families um, migrated from the from North Philadelphia to West Oak Lane. And then those groups migrated 
further out, further out into the suburbs of Jenkinton, Abington, et cetera. So my neighborhood was all black. There was one little white girl in my elementary, my kindergarten class, and she left after third grade. Amy was her name. I remember her. Um, and I think about how, you know, I was a kid that needed a certain kind of education. Um, and sadly, our, our Philadelphia public school system is a complicated one, which needs some help for it. And my mother knew that I needed something different. And she first sacrificed to pay for me to go to the uh, Catholic elementary school and then found a way to get me into Germantown Friends School, which was radically changing, um, or was radical rather, um, and, and brought so many changes into my life. And the, the, so, you know, the education was different, you know, in the Catholic school we had mass, in the Quaker school we had meeting, you know, it was, religion was, it was ingrained into the, was, was, was wrapped into the institution. It's, it's tough because they were so different, those places. Um, the Catholic parochial school where I had to sit in lines and walk in lines, sit in rows rather, walk in lines, had a uniform. And I got the GFS and the dress code was, you had to wear shoes and you couldn't have holes in obscene places. That's those were the dress codes. <laughs> like, you know, so it was, it was a real striking environment socially, uh, racially, around our only economic um, differences of where I come from, where I was coming to. It, I, it was so intense. I made a movie about it. That's my, my, my real <laughs> answer about it, but it was, uh, it was, it was, it was jarring. And also at the same time, um, the right path for me to pursue and take. I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, our next question is from Margaret Campion. Uh, I'll direct this to Emma first. Um, I want to piggyback on Emma's comments about the slowness of social justice movements compounded by the deliberate, deliberateness slowness of a Quaker process. We struggle with this on the CFS board. Feeling the urgency and the responsibility of making good decisions, what is too slow? Oh. I um I'm I'm torn. I'm I'm in a school community right now that is figuring out what what Quaker decision making process looks like for us. And having come from a school community that was very practiced in a, an institution, a school institution's version of Quaker decision making process, I find myself feeling like, um, well, I I have colleagues who feel like we're moving too slow, and I find myself thinking, actually, this is pretty quick compared to some, of, you know, some of the discussions, some of the issues that I've that I've been a part of. Um, so I think that there's a um, I'm, I'm not quite going to answer the question, but I think that there is, it's not too slow if everyone is committed to being part of the discussion um, and committed to seeing the discussion through to, um, to the sense of of continuing revelation and and to a willingness of um, uh, a willingness to participate and to have their mind changed and to um, and to accept and honor the ultimate decision that is made. Um, and so I think that when um, when we're talking about what what is too slow or or not, that if the community is committed to being part of it, then it can't, then it isn't too slow. Um, but but that's the first step. And I think that it then moves um, at the pace that it should when everyone is involved. Yeah, that's a that is a complicated question. Emma, and I appreciate you digging into it. I, I I struggle with that also. And the ways that I deal with it is I just go to individual students, you know, and making sure they they feel heard and taken care of in those moments. 
when an institutional policy is passed or discussed and we're told we'll get to it, I make sure I go to the students that I can and say, you know what, this has nothing to do with you and what you're worth. This is happening on a bigger level. And um, what are the ways to understand that? Not accept and just deal, but to understand that and not feel rejected or unheard. And I'm also careful that I'm not pushing too much of my experience on them. Because sometimes I'll be like, it's not that big of a deal. I'm like, okay, just making sure, but I want to give you the platform. <laughs> and they're like, that's your stuff, not mine. I'm like, fine. You know, <laughs> but but at the same time, I, I I'll I'll be the silly adult in the room, just like just triple triple making sure that what you heard, how they land on you, how you feel it. And I'm here. And it's, I've heard from some kids, you know, and I'm not even at the campus that much, that sometimes just seeing me walk around makes a difference. And our institutions are, I know they 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 find themselves in the struggle to get more faculty and staff of color. But I think back to going to Germantown Friends School and and the, I remember the moments, the first time I saw Joan in the hallway, you know, or saw, I saw a Sharon Askew or saw, saw a Howard who still is there, who's like head of maintenance, you know. Just the other day I was talking to, there's a woman who works at the school who's fantastic. And she's a woman who cleans in the school. And she pulled me aside and said, hey, I want to check in. I saw, I was talking to a student and she was upset and she was crying. And I talked to her and I calmed her down. And I was like, this is what it's about. She knew to come to me to make sure that someone else knew that a student was having a hard time. So those slow changes um, are hard to witness and digest. And I, I find myself trying to be patient and, and believe in their practice, and I just go right to the to the students to try and um, counter it when it whenever it's a problem. I also think that um, that transparency in process goes a long way towards that. Like when 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 it feels like nothing is changing, it feels like there's nothing being done. And so the the transparency and this is where we are in the process. We are having these discussions. We do have a group working on this. We are addressing here's where you can give your feedback. I think that that goes part one. It's part of the process and it's part of making change that is effective and that is not just a Band-Aid, but it's also so helpful and it feels so much better when you are looking and you feel like you're running up against a brick wall to have someone say, no, no, like here's a window into what we're doing, how we're doing it, how we're going to make this decision. And it takes a long time, but we're working through the steps of it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm thinking about um, <laughs> coming to decisions and the notion that um, it's not consensus in the strict definition, it's we really can, uh, as communities, come to a sense of the meeting. Mm. That is so that each of us is willing to participate, even though we may have some, uh, you know what, You're, there's always going to be a different way to look at it. But the fact that we can listen to each other and help each other understand what the <laughs> direction has been and why um that's for me a gift that that i i haven't i don't know of in other pl places and i certainly deeply appreciate having um having been a member of the society of friends and learned learned that that's certainly the the best way to uh, to make some pretty power important decisions Thank you. Um, if our panel does not have any further notes on that question, I can move to our next one. Um, okay, this will be our second to last question, um, and it's from Ingrid Lakey. I am on the board at a friend's school. What do you think board members need to understand about race and class as we strive to be an anti-racist school? Mm. <laughs> John, you've had the most board members, member, more, most board experience amongst us. 
Well, I, I, I accept that, but I, I certainly want to hear from, from uh, Emma and Andre as well. I, I would, you know, I, I have been on a number of boards. I am mostly on boards of friends institutions right now. Uh, and um, I, I would say that, that that's, a, that's the kind of question that I think a board should always be asking itself. And, um, you know, perhaps we are doing better than we used to uh, at it's recognizing that there's, there are a lot of questions that we need to think about around race and, and justice that we, have, we should not forget when we're looking at the budget or, or whatever. So that's, what, I mean, that's my, my main comment to offer that, that um, you know, I, someone asked, you know, will we ever reach a place where we will ha always have racial justice? Uh, no, I think we'll always be in a place where we need to be clear about what's important um, for, for the fact that we are a complex, uh, um, very diverse society. Yeah. My, Go ahead, Emma. My very short answer to the question is, is that the kids are way ahead of us and to ask them and ask them and ask them and ask them. I, I, I'll amplify Emma's, Emma's message and also Joan's message. I think you both said it well. You have to continue to ask the question. And also sometimes these young people, we can learn a lot from them because it's, for us, it's a, a meeting we need to set up. For them, it's Tuesday and they're ready to go. Um, so that I'll, I'll, I'll keep it short and just amplify both of those messages. you we only heard the last part of your line cooper if you were talking to us oh my mistake um our last question is um from marlena santoyo what if any do quakers have a responsibility to the vast majority of young people who can't get in a quaker school and don't have the financial resources to get anything but an unsatisfactory education Mm. <laughs> okay, I'm going to jump in and say that um, I, well, let, <laughs> I, I'm not being facetious in this answer. Andre came, got to a Quaker school by, by a basketball camp. And um, Probably, uh, even if he had only had that experience of summers in a, in a group that behaved that <laughs> the way they did, it would have been something. It would have been something important in his life. And um, of Emma, Emma didn't go to a Quaker school until she was in college, but um, so <laughs> for me, uh, I would say, so what I'm, what I'm saying is that not everyone has to go to a Quaker school to have an experience with, and I think part of the responsibility is that we all, that we have the three of us and anybody else who's involved in, edu in Quakerism and in education is to live the life that we believe we can live in order to contribute to, to other people. I, I have a son who is a, a college professor and he has been described by people as, oh, that's, well, that's why he does the, teaches the way he does. It's because he, he went to a Quaker school. So yes, there is work that we can do. And yes, I wish public education was more like the education I've had and that, that, that we have all had. It's not going to happen today, but I can keep working to make it better. And that's that that certainly has been the main concern I have. In fact, I was asked once by a journalist, well, you've only been in independent schools. Why do you care about public education? I care about that more than anything. I think this 
democracy will not survive unless we get those schools right. And I, and for me, uh, the challenge is to figure out how to help do that. Amen. Amen. I I I I think your your note, you articulated very well what I was trying to think of, you know the idea of the, the humans and individuals that we create, that's a way to spread the spread the, spread the gospel, for lack of a better phrase, um, in terms of how people go out into the world. I think about that with all of my students and the people that I meet in, in the meeting of what are the ways to think about how they are, um, will affect um, people. I also think that there are ways to use our resources and build programs. So that school that Joan and I keep mentioning, there's a program called the Breakthrough Program, along with the Basketball Reading Clinic. And Breakthrough is a, a, a program on the weekends where younger teachers are coming in and teaching kids from the community, um, giving them extra skills for, for school, um, school for, to have stronger school experiences, I should say. And also, there are a lot of schools in Philadelphia that I'm finding that are working on the elementary and the, pre, and the lower school elementary level that are trying to get students and they're not they're not charter all the ways i'm nothing against them but i think in philadelphia there's saint james there's jesu and these are all schools that have used their money power and privilege to go into low income communities and restructure their entire schools and create these free private schools um, that are all about getting children on a path to have a better education and the goal is to feed them to other schools all around philadelphia um, that um are some Quaker schools, some private schools, some public schools. But the main goal is let's go to where these kids are, let's capture them and train them um, and help them and love and support them. So I, hopefully that could be recreated um, around the country. But that's that's what I'm seeing um, here. I'll echo what, what has been said and just add, I think that Quaker schools have the responsibility to make um, you know, our budgeting decisions around making our school as accessible as possible to as many kids as we can. And then the kids in our rooms, our responsibility is to teach them and to and to send graduates into the world who are going to work and make public education work better for more students and make our schools more accessible for students and programs that are not in a traditional educational setting um, to give kids opportunities that they don't have right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What an incredible day this has been. And I want to thank all of you for your fantastic presentation. Um, everyone who has participated in the second event of the 2023 Black Quaker Lives Matter Film Festival and Forum. Thank you first to our incredible guests, Joan, Andre, and Emma. You were fantastic. Thank you very much. And thanks also to our remarkable co-sponsor, the American Friends Service Committee. I would like to thank also our talented Black Quaker Project team, Cooper Vaughn and Sue Spina in Philadelphia for their technical help, their expertise, and their passionate support and commitment. And thanks to you who have joined us today from around the world. We hope you can rejoin us in two weeks to celebrate International Women's Month on Saturday, 4th of March at the same time, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. For the film Sisters in Freedom, 2018. This film, narrated by my former Rutgers student, the Hollywood and TV star Cheryl Lee Ralph, whom some of you heard sing the Black National Anthem at the recent Super Bowl, <laughs> tells the extraordinary story of the Black and white women who created America's first organized female political force in their daring struggle to end the enslavement of Africans in the USA. Among the extraordinary women featured in this film is another African-American Quaker educator, Sarah Maps Douglas, 
1806 to 1882, a prolific teacher, author, fierce abolitionist, and ancestor of my hero, Paul Robeson. She was, she was especially involved in educating young black women about their bodies. Imagine 19th century that taking place. We will be joined for a post-screening discussion involving the eminent Haverford historian, Dr. Emma Lipsansky werner and author and Maps Bustille descendant, Joyce Mosley. We hope to see you then. Peace and blessings, friends. One love until we meet again.